How does one find meaning in a meaningless world? Ecclesiastes is a book in the Old Testament of the Bible, and it was written by Solomon, who was the same author who wrote Proverbs, which is often referred to as the, uh, you know, the Book of Wisdom. But Ecclesiastes is also often uh, thought of as a Book of Wisdom because it also has a lot to do with, you guessed it, wisdom. And the primary purpose of Ecclesiastes is to basically say to all future generations and existing generations uh, that Life is meaningless apart from God. The book of Ecclesiastes blew my mind. It's a very short book, it's only 12 chapters long, but it took me a couple days to read because like every single paragraph was just like, oh! Like I would read a paragraph and I would wanna move on and then I would be like, no Carter, you can't move on from this. You need to think about what you just read. Because the difference between Ecclesiastes and the book of Proverbs is, you know, the book of Proverbs is basically, it's just a collection of wise sayings. That's pretty much the whole book. Um, it's not a very personal book. Like you don't really learn a whole lot about Solomon as a guy and his own thoughts and feelings. You just learn about, you know, ideas that uh, he formulated throughout his life. But these ideas are not put into the context of his personal life within the book of Proverbs. Ecclesiastes is different in that Ecclesiastes is a book where Solomon is quite literally, you know, re-examining his life and uh, the fact that, you know, he did a whole lot of great, incredible things and a whole lot of horrible things. And what's fascinating to, to, to consider is that Solomon, I mean, he quite literally ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, he did, Oh, like I said, a whole lot of great things and a whole lot of horrible things, and he became wise because of that. But he also became tortured because of that. And you see that in the book of Ecclesiastes and his conclusion after examining the fact that he chased pleasure, came up empty, Ch chased success and praise, came up empty. His conclusion in the book is that all of it, everything, is meaningless unless God is a part of it. And so I highly recommend you read the book of Ecclesiastes. I mean, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's jump into the review and analysis portion of this video where we discuss all the passages within the book of Ecclesiastes that I think are worth discussing. The first passage I would like to discuss is Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. What I really think is so compelling about that little excerpt there is, um, you know, that phrase, there is nothing new under the sun. And this passage is very similar to a passage uh, within Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, where Marcus Aurelius talks about how there's never really a change in the constant rhythm of events. When you look at history, it's a cyclical, it has a cyclical nature. Yes, there's new technology, new events that happen, but still, it's empire succeeding empire, uh, people being born and people dying. And there's really nothing new. And it says in meditations, uh, that is why living 40 years is no worse than living a thousand. Would you really ever see anything new? That's what Marcus Aurelius had to say. And Solomon here is like, you know, is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. And in truth, not really. I mean, so many of the things that in our society that we think of as new or not really new, like people often say uh, it's progressive, uh, you know, things like uh, gay marriage, that sort of that acceptance of that sort of thing. They're like, ah, oh, this is new. It's not new. That's been accepted in previous societies. There's nothing new about it. Same thing like with uh, new age religion uh, or spirituality. A lot of people think, ah, oh, this is new. This is the evolved form of belief. But no, it's not. The new agey, you know, like I'm spiritual, not religious, that whole thing. I mean, that's one of the oldest ideas. One of the oldest religious ideas is that, you know, 
God is all around us. We're all God. I'm spiritual. There's spirits all around us, but there's not really any Godhead. I don't know. I just think I'm spiritual. That is so old, and yet we call it New Age, but of course it's not. And, you know, Solomon here, he expresses that idea, and he, you know, again, there is nothing new under the sun. That's a really like, potent sentence. And then he says, you know, there is no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. Eventually, even the great people, even Abraham Lincoln, will be forgotten. Eventually. I mean, there are so many people that were prominent figures in our history and the history of the world that we don't know the names of. They've been forgotten. I mean, the Library of Alexandria is you know, burned down. There's, I guarantee you there's whole histories of different peoples there that, uh, that existed at that time uh, in that library that we don't know the name of, don't even know existed. And uh, so yes, eventually we will all, you know, fade out of existence and fade out of the memories of those who follow us. And um, it's something to consider. And it's, it's really, uh, it's a hard thing to consider. Because um, you're like, well, where's the meaning in this? And that's essentially what Solomon is uh, making the point. He's like, well, if you're going to be forgotten and eventually everything's just going to redo itself, then really what is the meaning to be found in this crazy thing we call life? Now, verse 18 of chapter 1 also, I think, is absolutely worth looking at. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. In a lot of ways, this is true. I mean, me personally, I love learning. I love learning about history. I love, I love you know, knowledge is power. You know, I, I, I love that, that phrase and that whole sentiment. Um, but it is true, you know, the more you know, the more, the more aware you become of the evil and degradation in the world. And, uh, you know, the more grief is multiplied. There's multiplied. There's there's more uh, sorrow um, from that, and just in life experiences. The more you know, uh, yes, you may become more wise, but you also, you know, there's a lot of damage there, and uh, you know, there's this there's the old saying of ignorance is bliss, and in a sense that is true. Like when I was a kid, you know, I didn't have a care in the world, and I was blissful. I mean, I just like. I would go run around in my backyard and act like I was in a prehistoric park looking for dinosaurs. And it was a very pure time for me. And I know not everybody's childhood was that way, but for me it was that way. Um, but as I've gotten older and I've become more, you know, uh, knowledgeable of the world, uh, I have a much more difficult time regulating my mood, especially whenever there's politics involved or horrific events that happen. Um, you know, and I, I do wonder about people that, you know, live way out in the Arctic Circle, who are away from all the news and are away from most of uh, what we think of as common knowledge. And I wonder if they're happier. I know some of them are, because they quite literally don't have to deal with the troubles that we trouble our minds with. Next passage I would like to read and discuss is a long one, but it's so, it's incredible. And it is uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers, and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me, and all this my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. 
Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. It's fascinating how just about every person, if you ask them, like, do you want to be rich? Do you want to be famous? And most people would say, yes, yes, please. It's what I've always wanted. Um, but, you know, one of the things that's fascinating is when you actually look at these people who become rich and famous, who, who indulge in such great pleasures and, and really just live their lives as if they are their own god and do as they please, they all, a lot of them end up coming to the conclusion that, you know, is this it? Is this enough? I mean, Tom Brady several years ago, you know, he's like, he had won more Super Bowls than anyone, you know, he had a supermodel of a girlfriend. He had like everything you would think a man would, would want to be satisfied with. And he was like, is this it? There's gotta be something more. And same thing, like, you know, I think Jim Carrey is the guy who said, you know, I, I wish that everybody could be rich and famous, uh, at least just for a day. So that way they would realize that it's not what it's all cracked up to be. Um, and Solomon here is like, you know, I, I had a harem. I think he had like 700 wives, something like that. It was, he was a wild, wild guy. Um, I could be confusing him with someone else, but I'm pretty sure he was the one who had that very expansive, uh, harem. Um, you know, he had that, he had all the wealth and riches a man could have. He had power, he had fame, he had admiration from people and he indulged in what he wanted to indulge in, and he came to the conclusion that everything was meaningless. There was nothing gained under the sun by doing any of that. It's important to read passages like that and hear testimonies of people who actually have, you know, you know, had it all in, in, our, in, what our, in the way that our culture thinks having it all is like. Uh, it's really important to pay attention to those sorts of characters because, um, if you don't, then you may end up chasing the same dream that they chased, and you might actually achieve it, and you might discover, like them, that it's not actually all that you thought it was cracked up to be. The next passage is uh, verses 12 through 14 of the same chapter, and it reads, Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom, and all madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise man has eyes in his head, while the fool walks in darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. What Solomon is essentially saying here is it's better to be wise than to be a fool, obviously. But we all die in the end. The next passage I would like to discuss is Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. I also thought, as for men, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Man's fate is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the animal. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the spirit of man rises upward, and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth? That's a very curious verse. I don't really know what Solomon means by that, because... In verse 11 of that same chapter, uh, Solomon writes, uh, God has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And so he does talk about men having that eternal nature. I don't know, you have to read that passage in context because it definitely seems like he's talking like, oh, he's almost having like a nihilistic... Uh, you know, break here. This next passage is uh, rather convicting for me. Um, it is Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they are wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. As a dream comes when there are many cares, so the speech of a fool when there are many words. This passage is very convicting uh, to me in that, you know, I'm a non-denominational cr Christian, which means there's a whole lot of, there's a very, there's a severe lack of structure I've found in, in just that whole uh, conception of Christianity. And I'm really trying, having to come to terms with it in that like, 
in non-denominational churches, there are no like structured ways of praying. There's no instruction that I've ever encountered whenever I go to church. It's just the pastor gives a very, um, you know, good message. I like my pastor who he often brings up a lot of very wise things. Um, but like for my day to day, like spiritual life, I'm just like, when I pray, it's so there's no structure and, and I'm just like, I, I often feel like I'm just praying for things rather than, you know, actually having a conversation um, with God. And, and it's like lots of times I'm like, what am I doing? Like, this doesn't feel right. Because, you know, and, and Solomon kind of like that, that one part where he says, do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. And I got to say, I am often very hasty in my heart and I, to utter things before God. I need to look into like Orthodox Christianity and some of the more structured forms of Christianity to see what I think because I, I am beginning to be like, you know, I need some sort of actual grounding for my prayers other than I'm going to talk to God today. You know, I need something that's more formal and has you know tradition and history and and testing behind it um because otherwise i'll i'll you know succumb to the speech of a fool and use many words that are meaningless i feel very disingenuous when i'm like dear god please help for my day to go well tomorrow please help for me to sleep well please help for you know me to find a girlfriend or whatever. It feels very like needy. It feels like, ah, just give me things. And um, I don't like that. And clearly Solomon doesn't like that either. Uh, and so, yeah, as I said, this passage was very convicting for me. The next passage uh, actually immediately follows the passage we just finished discussing. It is uh, Ecclesiastes chapter five, verses four through seven. Uh, this passage is also very convicting uh, to me, uh, very troubling for me. It's not a troubling passage, uh, you know, as far as morality is concerned. It's just a troubling passage, uh, you know, as I said, for me personally, because I have made this mistake, and Solomon, you know, he's not alive today, but he's calling me out. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest to the temple, messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at you, at what you say, and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, stand in awe of God. I've I gotta say, I've made this mistake. I mean, I... Uh... I have made vows to God. God, I promise I will not do this. I will not do this. And I have broken those vows and um, have felt significantly diminished when I have broken those. And, you know, it's, uh, it's very foolish to make, to make vows that are, are risky. I mean, I, I, I made a vow to God last year about something and that vow is still uh, in effect. And uh, I better not mess it up. I better not break it because I will feel terrible and I might, you know, reap some consequences. Uh, it was a very foolish thing for me to do, uh, to make a reckless vow. Um, and, uh, you know, Solomon is basically saying, yeah, it's not a good idea. <laughs> um, just you should stand in awe of God and do your best to do God's will, but don't make a bet on your future self to fulfill a vow. Next, I would like to discuss Ecclesiastes chapter five, verse 15, and it reads, Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. What I really like about this verse is, you know, it, it's, I mean, you obviously heard this piece of wisdom before, you know, uh, you, you know, you don't take any of the wealth that you earn here on earth with you after you die. And you know, everybody's heard that sort of thing. But I what I really like about this verse is, you know, it starts off naked, a man comes from his mother's womb. And as he comes, so he departs. The whole point is that from the very beginning, like as soon as you come out of your mother's womb, you are naked. 
And whenever you die, while you may still have clothes on, and you might have like some things in your casket, your soul is naked as it was before. Uh, and I don't know, it's just, that verse really, I was like, oh, I just, it just painted a visual for me where I'm like, yeah, you brought nothing into this world and you'll bring nothing out of it. Uh, at least when it comes to material possessions. So, so far we've been talking about a whole lot of passages where Solomon's like, man, everything's meaningless. Uh, but here's a, a passage where Solomon, uh, you know, talks about something that does have meaning. Um, of course, it's conditional, the meaning. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's, a, it's kind of an upbeat <laughs> passage uh, about, uh, about meaning in life, for sure. And the passage is Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 18 through the end of the chapter, 18 through 20. Then I realized that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him, for this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. This point is reminiscent of, uh, of another point. I can't remember exactly where it says this in the Bible, but there is a verse where it says, um, Every good thing given and every gift is from above, handed down to you from the Father of lights, where there is no variation or shifting shadow. This verse is similar to whatever that verse was that I just cited, in that, uh, or I should say this passage uh, is reminiscent of that other verse. Um, in that, no, Solomon is saying your job, your, your work, uh, the joys of your life, they do have meaning. Um, they are gifts from God. Uh, essentially he's saying the only things that are, uh, you know, that really have meaning in life are the gifts of God and you should enjoy them and you shouldn't be shameful about enjoying them. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful passage. Moving on to chapter 7, I would like to read uh, verses 1 through 6. A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. What I love so much about this passage, or, or particularly uh, verses three and four, what Solomon is saying is, look, the heart of the wise you know, is in the halls of mourning. What that means is wise people ponder things like death. They ponder the fact that this is all finite, you know, this is all temporal. Uh, they, they ponder these things and become wise because of it. Whereas the fool just goes to the house of pleasure and distracts himself from these things that he needs to consider. With the verses like verse one, where it says, a good name is better than fine perfume and the day of death better than the day of birth. It's kind of a puzzling verse, but in a lot of ways, I think it's, it has a, a great deal of truth in that the day of birth, you mean you don't even remember your day of birth. And yes, it's meaningful in that you came into this world, but the day of death is the day that you go to the next one, perhaps. And the day of death comes after your life. And what happens after your day of death, uh, at least from the Christian perspective, is dependent on what happened between your birth and death. And so therefore the day of death, which was the end of that, that situation, is more meaningful uh, than the day of birth. I don't know, it's just a fascinating uh, passage here because it's emphasizing that wisdom is good and that wisdom is found in suffering and there is meaning in suffering because you can find wisdom in it. Now the next verse I would like to discuss, I don't really know what to think about it. It's verse 14 of chapter seven, so same chapter, and it reads, when times are good, be happy, but when times are bad, consider. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. At first glance, this passage, like really, I was like, whoa, does God make good and evil? 
uh, and therefore is responsible for good and evil. That seems like a bit of a tricky idea uh, if we're going to if we're going to say he's all good. Um, but then I read uh, the the footnote that goes along with this verse, and it definitely uh, offered a view of this verse that uh, was different from my initial view. And I'm just going to read it. God allows both good times and bad times to come to everyone. He blends them in our lives in such a way that we can't predict the future or count on human wisdom and power. We usually give ourselves the credit for the good times. Then in bad times, we tend to blame God without thanking him for the good that comes out of it. When life appears certain and, uh, and controllable, don't let self-satisfaction or complacency make you too comfortable, or God may allow bad times to drive you back to him. When life seems uncertain and uncontrollable, don't despair. God is in control and will bring good results out of tough times. Moving on to verses 16 through 18 of chapter 7. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked, and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp of the one and not let go of the other. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. What's interesting about this verse is, you know, that verse 18, it says, it is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. And he's even talking about wickedness there. Um, but I don't think he's saying, you know, you can be wicked sometimes, you can be good at other times. I really don't think that's what this passage is saying. I think what this passage is saying is, you know, don't be over-righteous or over-wise because you might actually become wicked as a result of that. If you go to this far extreme, you might actually become wicked when you think you're being righteous. And likewise, if you want to indulge in, in these sins, if you want to be a fool, don't do that. That Don't go all the way over there. Don't Because you might kill yourself as a result. You might ruin your entire being. Avoid that extreme. Stay here in the middle to an extent. And obviously not in every circumstance. He's not, like I, said, like I said, I don't think he's saying, you know, do some evil here, do some good there. I think what he's saying is just avoid extreme thinking. Don't think, oh, those people are so evil and so wicked and horrible and I hate them. And also don't think of yourself, oh, I'm the best, I'm the greatest person ever, and, you know, I'm righteous and all this sort of thing, because both views are wrong. Verse 26 is a curious uh, verse. It's, it's great. Solomon's kind of like warning men, beware, beware of the other, or a certain kind of the other. Uh, yes, this is verse 26 of chapter 7. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. Don't succumb to uh, good looks. Don't be seduced by foolishness, uh, because there is such a thing as a truly evil woman who will ruin your life. Trust me, boys, I'm Solomon. I've had many wives. Some of them were demons. Yeah, the man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. It is true, you know, uh, if you really have convictions and values that you really, you care about and that you hold to and you stand by, it's very unlikely, or at least the likelihood of you being ensnared by a very foolish woman simply because she's hot, uh, you know, that likelihood goes way down because you have values. You have things that you care about more than just um, shallow things. You're a deep individual. But if you're a foolish sinner who lives for flesh and pleasure, oh yeah, you're gonna fall for, you're gonna fall for the, the good looking blonde who's like seems like a nice slut, but who's just a slut that's gonna ruin your life. <laughs> now, moving on to verses 28 and 29 of Ecclesiastes chapter 27, we get a very curious passage that if read out of context, sounds horrible and misogynistic. Uh, I'm gonna read these two verses uh, and then we'll discuss. While I was still searching but not finding, I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. This only have I found. God made mankind upright, but men have gone in search of many schemes. That line, but not one upright woman among them all, made me go, what? Okay, I mean, you can think that, dude, but I, I disagree with you. There's a lot of upright women in the world. 
Um, and at first glance, you know, it's like, wow, that's horrible. Um, but let me read what my Life Application Bible uh, says in the footnotes uh, for this verse, uh, and then I'll also bring some further context to the discussion as well. Did Solomon think women were not capable of being upright? No, because in the book of Proverbs, he personified wisdom as a responsible woman. The point of Solomon's statement is not that women are unwise, but that hardly anyone, man or woman, is upright before God. In his search, Solomon found that goodness and wisdom were almost as scarce among men as among women, even though men were given a religious education program in his culture and women were not. In effect, the verse is saying, I have found only one in a thousand people who is wise in God's eyes. No, I have found even fewer than that. I agree with just about all of that because it is true in Proverbs, which was also written by Solomon, he did personify wisdom as a woman. And not only that, the ending of Proverbs is a, a beautiful passage describing an upright woman. Let me, let me flip back a couple pages to Proverbs, make sure I'm not messing up here. Actually, I think I was wrong here. Uh, I don't think Solomon wrote the very end of uh, the book of Proverbs. It was uh, King Lemuel uh, who actually wrote the ending of the book of Proverbs. So I don't know if that, that reasoning uh, holds up for bringing context to this, uh, to this particular uh, passage as far as saying that Solomon described an upright woman in the book of Proverbs. Um, Proverbs. Proverbs certainly does, but Solomon, again, like I said, I don't think he actually wrote that ending portion of uh, the book of Proverbs, but the piece of evidence of him describing wisdom personified as a woman, that still stands. Moving on to chapter eight, I would like to discuss verses 14 and 15. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. Righteous men who get what the wicked deserve, and wicked men who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. So I commend the enjoyment of life, because there is nothing better for a man under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany him in his work all the days of the life God has given him under the sun. So in a sense, Solomon is saying here, you know, your perception at least I get out of this passage, I get the idea that your perception of what you have in your life matters. And you should enjoy your life whether you get what you think good people deserve or if you get what you think bad people deserve. You should enjoy what you have because you know full well that other people who are just as good as you do not have what you have. Now this next passage is one of those kind of confusing passages. Uh, my Life Application Bible has a good uh, nugget of uh, info on it, on how to uh, interpret uh, the, the passage. But the passage is uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, and we'll read it and we'll discuss because it is, uh, it's a difficult paragraph to uh, unpack, for sure. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward and even the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun." Now I'll read the life application explanation for this. When Solomon says the dead know nothing, and that there is no work, planning, knowledge, or wisdom in death, he is not contrasting life with afterlife, but life with death. After you die, you can't change what you have done. Resurrection to a new life after death was a vague concept for Old Testament believers. It was only made clear after Jesus rose from the dead. The reason this passage is so tricky is because it does say, you know, but the dead know nothing, they have no further reward. It sounds like it's saying the dead literally, you know, they disappear, there is there is no afterlife. And I tend to think that uh, Solomon does believe in an afterlife uh, because, you know, I mentioned earlier, he mentioned that m man has eternity, and also we'll see later, uh, there is more of that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so it does seem like Solomon believes that there is something after death. Um, but his point here is that the dead, um, for them, as far as this world is concerned, the world under the sun, the dead have nothing. They have no further reward from this place that we're all living in. Uh, they, uh, they are quite literally, um, they have passed on 
and they cannot come back, they cannot change what has happened, they cannot plan, they cannot do any of the things that we do right now. Moving on to verses 11 and 12 of chapter 9, uh, these verses, again, you know, it's like sometimes Solomon seems kind of nihilistic. Um, and here he definitely kind of seems that way. But it, again, if you read Ecclesiastes, uh, the book in its entirety, it's pretty clear to me that he's not nihilistic. Um, but this passage on its own, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's hardcore. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net, or birds are taken in a snare, so men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. That is all true about life. And I think if you read this passage in the greater context of Ecclesiastes, what Solomon is really saying is, look, um, life is unfair, or may seem unfair to you, and life on its own is this, it's this random, you know, kind of dark, cruel thing. Solomon is basically saying, life is just, the suffering that is in life is meaningless if there is no God who has a purpose in it all and with you. This next passage, I just love. Uh, I'm just going to read it. It's kind of a nuff said passage, so we will read it and then I will say nuff said. This is verse 13 through 18 of chapter 9. I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man poor but wise, and he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength, but the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. The quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Enough said, although I want to say something. So <laughs> um, it's just, you know, what Solomon is emphasizing is that sometimes the greatest wisdom comes from the poorest, most overlooked people. And those poor and overlooked people should not be overlooked. In fact, they should be exalted for the wisdom they extol. And the ruler of fools should be cast down for the foolishness they extol. Moving on to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. Uh, this passage is a passage where Solomon really kind of, and he, he really kind of uh, shores up uh, what he's really trying to get across in these last couple chapters of Ecclesiastes, where he really, within this just one passage, he he draws a contrast between uh, what is meaningless in life uh, and what is meaningful. Um, and I'm just going to read the passage because uh, I don't really have much more to say until I do that. So let's do that. <laughs> Be happy, young man, while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. So then, banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body, for youth and vigor are meaningless. Solomon is saying, you know, don't take things for granted and don't be reckless with your life. Live as well as you can and recognize that just about everything in life is meaningless. But there is meaning to your life if God is a part of it. And actually, there's meaning to your life even if you don't think God is a part of it. Because God will bring you to judgment. And he knows that you do all the things you do. As I said, in the closing chapters of Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon's main message really comes through. And uh, it really makes itself known in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark, and the clouds return after the rain. When the keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men stoop, 
when the grinders cease because they are few, and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when men rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint, when men are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and desire no longer is stirred, then man goes to his eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Remember him before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring or the wheel broken at the well and the dust returns to the ground it came from and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. That passage is so like just beautiful in the way it's written. Um, but here you see Solomon's great, you know, message. Remember God, stick with God throughout all of this, throughout your whole life, remember him. And again, the eternity of man, the eternal soul of man, life after death, that is emphasized here in the end, whenever Solomon says, um, you know, the man goes to his eternal home and mourners go about the streets. All the pleasures, all the achievements, the great wealth and the great, you know, the orgies or whatever it is you're into, that's meaningless. Um, you need to stick to God because God is really the only thing that makes this thing, life, meaningful. Now I'm going to read uh, my Life Application Bible again because it, it, they really did a good job of uh, interpreting and putting a lot of these different passages into understandable terms. And uh, they had a couple footnotes for the passage I just read that I think are really helpful. Well, they were certainly helpful to, to me, and I think will be helpful to you. This first footnote is on uh, verse 1 of chapter 12. A life without God can produce a bitter, lonely, and hopeless old age. A life centered around God is fulfilling. It will make the days of trouble when disabilities, sickness, and handicaps cause barriers to enjoying life satisfying because of the hope of eternal life. Being young is exciting, but the excitement of youth can become a barrier to closeness with God if it makes young people focus on passing pleasures instead of eternal values. Make your strength available to God when it is still yours, during your youthful years, don't waste it on evil or meaningless activities that become bad habits and make you callous. Seek God now. This next footnote is over verses 6 and 8. The silver cord, golden bowl, pitcher, and wheel symbolize life's fragility. How easily death comes to us. How swiftly and unexpectedly we can return to the dust from which we came. Therefore, we should recognize life as a precious resource to be used wisely and not squandered frivolously. Next footnote is over verses 7 and 8. Stripped of God's spirit, our bodies return to dust. Stripped of God's purpose, our work is in vain. Stripped of God's love, our service is futile. We must put God first over all we do and in all we do because without him we have nothing. Knowing that life is futile without God motivates the wise person to seek God first. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the final passage uh, in the review and analysis portion of this Ecclesiastes Bible book review. And it also happens to be the final passage of Ecclesiastes, the book itself. And uh, this is part of verse 13 and all of verse 14, which are, of course, the last verses. Uh, of chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, those are my thoughts on the book of Ecclesiastes. Now I want to know what you think of the book of Ecclesiastes if you have read it. Please leave any thoughts or comments you may have in the comment section below. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, if you like this video, please like it and subscribe. Tell your friends about the channel. And never forget to...